Our lesson this morning comes from 1 John, the third chapter, starting in the 16th verse. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or in speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what he pleases. And this is his commandment. That we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may remember it. It existed before the red box booths. It was known as Blockbuster Video. Big blue sign, big yellow letters, there was one on every corner. There were 9,000 of them in the United States. They had 83,000 employees at the height of their business. Not around anymore. They missed the digital train. However, they went bankrupt and closed down about 09 or 10. In the year 2000, a little small niche company came to Blockbuster and said, buy us out for just $50 million. And Blockbuster said, nope, we don't want to do that. And that little niche company, Netflix. Last year, they netted $33 billion in revenue. We are told that we need to get out of the box, that everybody wants to get out of the box. And what we have is an illustration of blockbuster video refusing to get out of the box, refusing to think a different thought. So what we're told is we need to crawl out of the box, jump out of the box, leap and spring out of the box, walk around the box, get away from the box, think outside the box, live outside the box, stand on the box, look down on the box, kick the box, yeet the box. Yes. And for those of you who know what yeet means, I want to tell you that the past tense of the verb is not yeeted, it's yote. So look that up. I was out of the box working that into the sermon. Whatever, we don't want to live in the box or stay in the box. And from corporate boardrooms to church conference rooms, a cadre of consultants has been hired to get us to think new and different and progressive and out of the box thoughts. Back when we were United Methodists, there was a guy roaming around the annual conference. His name was Gil Rendell, and Gil Rendell met with all the district superintendents and all the bishops in the South Central jurisdiction, and Gil Rendell's mantra was, you need to get into the balcony. Stole it from Heifetz, for those of you who are management gurus, stole it from Heifetz, get up in the balcony and look at the great perspective on the dance floor. Meanwhile, on the dance floor, everybody's leaving. And did anybody stop it? No, because in Methodism, you had bishops in the cabinet who were too busy up in the balcony, looking at perspective, trying to figure things out because they'd been told by somebody to get out of the box. But what happens when you get too far out of the box?
Volkswagen. Two German words brought together. People's car, Volkswagen. They had bugs. They made bugs. For a while, that's all they made. I had a 1971 yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Car's name was Sassafras. Sassafras took me 175,000 miles through the southern part of the United States. Sassafras and I did college together. Sassafras and I went to Florida to serve as a summer youth director together. Sassafras and I did seminary together. She was a good car. Four speeds. If you wanted air conditioning, you just opened the little vent windows and pointed at yourself and tried to get enough speed. You could get a certain length behind a tractor trailer rig and draft them and they would carry you at a rate of about 30 miles a gallon and going downhill with a tailwind, you could get a Volkswagen Beetle to go maybe 72 miles an hour, maybe. Volkswagen doesn't make Beetles anymore. They decided to go for SUVs and luxury automobiles. But don't, don't worry because BMW picked up that market when they started building Mini Coopers. A Mini Cooper is to a millennial what a Volkswagen was to us boomers. It's okay to get outside the box, but don't lose the box. The box is what got you here. The box represents your core values. The box represents your core competencies. The box. I want to say it's time for the church to jump back into the box. We need to get back in. We need to pull the lids over our heads. We need to hang out inside that box. Just sit in the dark and think about the box for a while. We need to identify what it is we do best and do those things. We need to make decisions out of our strengths. Not some nebulous get out of the box and think a new thought thought. Because what did the writer of Ecclesiastes say about these new thoughts? There's nothing new under the sun, right? So what I'm going to suggest for us as a church is we need to get back in the box and do the things that are part of our core values and do them well. First John, little children, let us love. That's how the early church was known, by their love. They loved everybody. They loved each other. They loved the world. They even loved the people that persecuted them. They were known by their love. Little children, let us love, not in word or in speech. Don't talk about it. Don't write about it. Don't study it. Don't ponder it. Don't dissect it. Don't do all the verb tenses of it or the four verbs for it, but love and truth and in action, do it. Love is action. Love is what we do. Jesus told a story. It goes like this. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe in him. We are to believe. We are to believe in Jesus Christ. 
And then we are to act in love. There are people all around us looking for community, for authentic community. They want to see a church that practices what it preaches. They want to see a church and participate in a church where lives are being changed, where faith is being challenged and deepened. Soren Kierkegaard wrote that the problem is that too many people are looking at Jesus as a great teacher, a great philosopher. And Jesus does not want to recruit admirers, but he wants to call us to be followers, to do his work, to serve in his name in our world. And in one of his parables, Kierkegaard told of a man who was walking down city streets and he saw a big sign in a window. And the sign read, pants pressed here. Delighted to see the sign, he went home and gathered up all of his wrinkled laundry, carried it into the shop and put it on the counter. What are you doing, the shopkeeper demanded. I brought my clothes here to be pressed, the man said, just like your sign said. Oh, you've got it all wrong, the owner said. We don't actually do that here. We're in the business of making signs. We don't do these things, he was saying. We just talk about them. Kierkegaard said that's the problem with the church. We advertise ourselves as a place that is showing God's love and doing Christ's work. And people come to us and they fit, find neither God's love or God's work going on. Because we're just talking about it. We're not living it. Scholars speculate that 1 John is actually a sermon. It's a sermon that explains John 15, the whole abide imagery of the vine and the branches. Later on in that chapter, Jesus said this, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go first and bear fruit and that the fruit will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you love one another. Back to 1 John. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother and sister in need and yet refuses to help. The Greek at the end of that sentence actually reads, who sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to be compassionate. And it's that word that is translated compassion, it's translated pity, it's translated mercy. It means feeling it right here. And what I'm going to suggest to you that what John is doing in writing 1 John is he's talking to the church. He's not saying you need to go out and give your money and stuff to the poor people out there. He's not saying that you need to take care of some anonymous individuals or block of individuals. What John is saying is you need to show your brother and sister in Christ, your brother and sister in the church, God's love. How do you do that? If you see them with the need, you go and do everything you can do to meet the need. It's about becoming more loving to each other. John, in the 15th chapter of John, he's not talking to the world. He's not talking to 
people who don't know him, he is talking to his own people. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And this is my commandment to you disciples about how you to treat other disciples. You are to love them because no greater love has anyone than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Part of the New Testament is written specifically to the church about how to behave with church people. And yes, absolutely, we need to continue to apply that learned behavior to our world, but we need to start with ourselves. We need to learn to love each other. But how can you love each other if you don't know each other? So one of the things that Leanne is going to do and has started doing is sort of answering the question, how do we get to know each other? Because you see what goes on is you may be sitting on the road with somebody you've seen for years and you've forgotten their name. And you won't go say, I've forgotten your name. Please remind me of your name. You won't do that. No, no. Or it happens a couple of times every month. People will pass each other in the hallway here and they will recognize each other from the real world. And they'll say, I didn't know you came here. How long have you been going to Trinity? 20 years. How long have you been going to Trinity? 15 years. And we're so afraid that something's going to happen like that that we might be embarrassed. You know what we do? Huh? In worship, and I've actually heard this. Y'all told me this one, Brother Doug. We see people in worship we don't know. Well, have you walked down and introduced yourselves to them? No, we're embarrassed to do that. There must be a better way. There are some members of my staff that once they see you, they are going to Facebook stalk you. They are official. They have you know, the software on their phone, if they can get a picture of that face, even in a mirror, they will know who you are in about 13 seconds. How can we love each other when we don't know each other? So we're going to work on that. And why are we doing that? So we can become more loving. Oh, that's hard. Yeah, it is. You remember what Paul said about it? You were probably there when some preacher read it to you. You may have been very dressed up, standing next to somebody who was very dressed up on a platform with a lot of people very dressed up, and the preacher said something like this, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. That's tough. Or what about the words of Jesus? You heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you can add the implied, be perfect in love, even as your heavenly Father is perfect in love. That's tough. I don't want to love my enemies. I want to make some revenge lists. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, love. Love each other. Love your enemies. That's the work the church is called to do. Not discuss it. Not have a sermon about it. Not have a Sunday school lesson about it. But to go do it. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, 
What must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And one of the things some churches have done a very good job of is they will give you a list of 10 things you're not supposed to do and a list of five things you're supposed to do. And if you don't do the big 10 and you do the big five, you are instantly in heaven because of what you do. Hmm. Some of you need to look up works righteousness. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, I'd be a lot better if I could do something to inherit eternal life rather than have faith. And Jesus said to him, what's written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, you've given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him, went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. We knew that about preachers, didn't we? So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and the crowd leans in because they want to hear what this Samaritan's going to do because they speculated that the original robbers were probably Samaritans. So they're not sure what Jesus is about to say. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with Pity. He was moved with pity. It's that same Greek word that I read to you and says, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses pity to them? He had pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his animal and brought him to the end and took care of him. And the next day took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and I'll come back. I'll repay you whatever you spend. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, Go and do likewise. God's called us to be a loving community. And we talk about loving people out there and loving the world and loving the outcast and loving the broken and loving the sinner as we ought to. But the New Testament starts with us learning to love each other. Learning to practice community and compassion with each other. It's a hard thing to do. It's a strategic shift we must make. It's a box that we must jump back into and operate out of our core competencies, our core calling, and the core of our lives, Jesus Christ. Would you stand and pray with me? Oh God, you called us to love, to love others as you have loved us. And that's hard, Lord. Love is chaotic often, it's confusing, it's draining. And yet, it's what you called us to do. It's what you showed us in your sacrifice for us on Calvary. 
It's that platinum rule that no greater love has any person than he laid down his life for his friends and you laid down your life for us. Help us, Lord, as we lay down our lives for others. As we pour into others the love that is within us, that has been given to us, through your spirit. Bless us, God, as we come to know each other, as we come to love each other, for that is our core. We pray in your name. Amen.